Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and today I'm at the wheel of what is literally and figuratively the Mini's biggest rival back in the 1960s and 70s. Yes, this is a Hillman Imp. This particular car is a 1967 Super Imp. So let's take it for a drive and see what it's like. And don't forget, if you like this video, hit like and subscribe. Now a word from our sponsors and on with the video. Furious Driving, presented by Diamond Bright, keeping the Furious fleet shining, and you can protect, clean, and care for your car with 10% off site wide using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online marketplace for appreciating classic cars, with more cars added every week. And now, like Dumb and Bright, Lancaster Insurance Services is a company I've been a happy customer of for quite some time. Lancaster are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK, covering all areas of vintage to modern classic car and motorbike. So give them a call and see if you can save on your cover. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving. Now, it could be said we do not have enough Roots Group cars on the channel, but today we're rectifying that with this one, possibly the smallest of the later Roots Group cars, Mini's biggest small competitor, the Imp. Now this particular car is a 1967 Imp Super, and we'll come back to this particular car in a second because it's quite an interesting history, but the Imp as a car ran from 1963 until 1976, first under the Roots Group and finally under Chrysler when they took the company over. Interestingly, those dates also match up with the Rover P6, also launched in 1963 and running through until 1976 and under different ownership by the end of its tenure. However, there is a certain amount of rivalry between Rover P6s and Imps. Well, purely from the impen, because the Rover P6 was the very first car of the year in 1963. And many argue, especially in imp circles, that if it hadn't been for the P6, the imp would have been the first car of the year. And perhaps if it had, it may have a bigger recognition in the classic car world. Anyway, let's look at this car and the history. So what brought about the development of the imp in the first place? Because the Roots Group had been known for its big, heavy, frankly thirsty luxury saloons. But in 1956, there was a big party. They called it the Suez Canal Party or crisis or something. Anyway, suddenly petrol was massively expensive and there was none of it around and sales of small frugal cars just went through the roof and sales of big engine cars dropped through the floor. Roots knew they needed something in a hurry and two of their budding young engineers, Michael Parks and Tim Fry, who respectively were the son of a chairman of Alvis, who went on to become a Formula One driver for Ferrari, and Tim Fry, who went on to become chief of engineering at Roots Group, went to the Roots director of engineering, B.B. Winter, and said, we can design the car you need. And he said, well, all right, off you go then. And they did. And so just a few short years later, they had the car. The first prototypes were nicknamed the Slug because they looked a little bit like a bubble car and they were not well received. So it turns out initially they couldn't do what they wanted, but they went back to the drawing board and they came up with this, which is basically a mini Corvair. Now bear in mind the Corvair came out in 1960 and it did have a lot of influence over other designs around the world. But this is kind of a greatest hits, a playbook of the best bits of people's cars from all over the place. So we've got the Mini's massive interior space. We've got the Volkswagen Beetle and the Corvair's rear engine. We've got an amazing low price and we've got lots of innovation in this car. It's a very, very clever car indeed. The idea was that by putting the engine in the boot, they could have people's feet stretch out further so they have a much bigger cabin for a much smaller space. And it kind of works. It does have a real big car feel inside of it. Down here at the front of the car, we have got a faux grille with the Super Imp badge on there and the Hillman script along the front. It looks like it's got a radiator, but like the Corvair, people just like to have something on the front, otherwise it just looks a bit strange not to have anything. Corvairs, for example, initially had nothing on the front, and then later models added a fake grille, and aftermarket fake ones are available. So, jumping underneath here, the bonnet raises like a regular bonnet. Regular bonnet stay, find a hole for that. And we've got actually not as much space as you might imagine. In fact, it's probably not really any better than the Mini or marginally better than the Mini considering it's a, quite a bit bigger of a car considering it's a, a compact still. We've got a full size spare wheel just here. We do have quite a bit of random space, not very usable down behind the headlamp bowls and in front of the wheel wells. Uh, you could put a few things in there, but you've got to be careful not to knock the wires off the back of the lights. Interesting how far forward the wheels are pushed, like on a Mini, they're out into the corners, which aid with the handling, which is actually pretty good on these things. Now, while the front of the car was devoid of much stuff, the back end is far more interesting, including a couple of notable firsts for mass-produced British cars. First mass-produced British rear engine car and first mass-produced British all aluminium engine, aluminium head and aluminium block which is amazing, well it did cause a few problems later on. 
So this engine, which you'll notice, is actually canted over at 45 degrees to give a lower deck lid height and a lower centre of gravity. It's actually based on the Coventry Climax FWMA fire pump engine or motor. So this is a car powered by a fire engine pump. Not even the engine, just the pump. Their original plan had been to make it in 800, 875 and 998 cc versions, giving different power outputs, but ultimately cost and complications meant that all the road going cars came out with the 875s. There are some racing versions of the 998 with a wet liner in them, but those are quite rare and quite valuable. Now you'll notice it has got a radiator here at the back facing forwards because it uses a vortex of air coming over the car and sucked back in through this fan just here into the fan and out through a dead spot under the car. So quite an unusual cooling system. This car also has an alternator fitted which makes it much more usable day to day rather than the dynamo which it would have originally had. Now another new and novel feature of this car was its ability to carry loads in a relatively small car. First of all, on the back of the car we do have these little metal strips, meaning you can tie things onto the boot without denting the, uh, the panel work. But the rear window has a button, so you can actually open it, raise it up there. You've got a great big trough down here that you can load with luggage, which gives you tons more space. Like an extra boot behind the back seat effectively, really useful. But better than that, undo the little rubber catches just here, the seat flips forward, and you've got yourself an entire load space here in the back, like in a Porsche 911. So you've got a ton of space. If you need to carry big things, you can feed them here through the back window onto this huge flat space and really carry some big stuff, which does make this car incredibly practical. Right, let's take a look around the inside of the car. First of all, we've got these nice angular chrome door handles with a push button with a lock in the end of the button. Open that up. We've got what's well, actually a fairly substantial door for a 1960s compact car. Quite thick, quite solid padded trim all the way down in behind the door bin. There is actually a complete metal door bin, which is also doubling as the door pull. And these very, again, angular, sharp, space age, 60s style door furniture of the door pull and the window winder. And this beautiful pressed or turned metal aluminium insert here, giving it some real, it's got a 60s flair. We also have a quarter light, so we get a bit of breeze through the car if we need to. Stepping inside a bit more, we've got seats which have no headrests at all. that also flip forward with no latches because this is the 1960s. My uh, 69 Mini is exactly the same. Blue vinyl looking very nice with dark grey carpet to match it. Step inside. It's a little bit tight getting your feet around the A-post, but once you're in, and that's quite a big wheel well protrusion, you do have a fair bit of space for your feet, although they are pushed quite a long way over to the middle of the car. I would expect my accelerator foot to be about there really, rather than down there where it actually isn't. If, had I known what these were like, I would probably have worn some smaller shoes. Now, first of all, big question, what's the tea shelf like? Well, not special unless you're into espressos or very tiny thimbles of tea, but lots of ventilation blowing up onto the window to keep you clear and seeing where you're going. The dashboard pressing does have a leather texture molded into the surprisingly hard plastic, actually, but there's also another groove with extra lines down here giving just a little bit more something to look at and in the center we do of course have a communal ashtray for everyone in the front of the car then in front of the driver we have got our instrument binnacle area which has got the majority of the controls the readouts all that kind of stuff first of all in the center a strip speedo except it's not it's a strip speedo with a needle in the middle going to 90 miles an hour on the right hand side of that we've got our fuel gauge which suggests we can take six gallons or 27 litres. Incidentally, the 1963 Rover P6 has got a 12 gallon tank, so or plus actually two gallons of reserve, so less than half the fuel capacity of a P6. On the left-hand side, we've got our temperature gauge and our turn signals. There we go. Little green lamp, little orange lamp, little red lamp for all our controls there. This car has only got 61,000 miles on it as well. Now, although these have aged somewhat, we do have a fair bit of patina on them. I absolutely love these stalks here. Instead of coming out of the steering column, they're coming out of the binnacle itself. Little chrome ring around it. This is your light control on the left for high beam and dip. Light switch itself is just there on the left. On the right hand side are your indicators, left and right, and of course the horn. Oh, a wee Scottish pub because it was built in Linwood. And our wipers, Oh, this little switch down here. Whoa, that's fun. And they self-park as well, amazing. 
And running the full width underneath the dashboard, we do have a sub T shelf, which gives us a lot of storage for bits and bobs and general detritus. Our heater controls, hot to cold, is slung underneath there. And the actual blower controls, almost like an afterthought, are right down here in the middle under the dashboard. There's no center console, which does give more space for your feet, but less room for storage. In the center, we've got our manual gearbox, four speed manual, linkages going into the back of the car. And interestingly, the choke control is down here. Mark 1 cars actually had an auto choke, but it wasn't well received and so it was ditched and a manual choke replaced in the Mark 2s onwards. Behind that, an actual proper metal handbrake. And then that's kind of it. We've got sun visors, we've got a little lamp, and we've got our rear seats. Let's take a look in the back. So the non-fastening seat folds forward and you duck your head and climb in. And we've got a big bench seat. These seat belts are actually for the front seat passengers. The rear seat passengers, the ones are mounted here in the back behind the uh, rear wheel well, because these B posts are really not substantial enough to take a seat belt. You do have this folding seat here, again, not latched apart from the rubber straps which hold it in place. You've got another ashtray on the left-hand side, huge side bins, and then put the seat back, and it's a bit tight on your knees. I mean, you wouldn't want to go too far, but it's kind of okay for a car this small and like a full-size adult, it's actually not too terrible. Headroom wise, it's just touching, so you wouldn't want to go too far, but it's not the end of the world. I wouldn't mind going for a short trip in it. It is quite a light and airy place to be. Right, let's get the imp out on the road. Now, first of all, you have to remember that if there's no door handle, you have to use the door bin as a pull. And secondly, we've got this mad old style static seat belt with a buckle comes up in front of your chest. I've got the same thing in the passenger seat of my Rover P6 2000 and it confuses literally everyone. A little bit of choke because it's freezing cold outside and the engine's not really warmed up anymore. It's got cold from setting. Right hand indicator and off we pop. Let's go down this road here. I've no idea where we're going. And this thing is just remarkable with how smooth it is and how isolated you are as the driver and the passenger from the engine. It's behind you, it's slung out the back, it's doing all this vibrating and noise and stuff where well, you don't really notice it. That's really quite impressive. Really well isolated. So this particular car has a really interesting story. It belongs to a friend of mine who, he's had quite a few of the things, so he knows inside and out. And it came from a friend of his who was also an imp collector who picked up about 30 years ago. And then because he was not in a hurry to do anything with it, he coated it in oil, wrapped it in hay bale plastic and left it in a field for 29 years. When it was eventually uncovered again, no one expected anything of it. They probably thought it was going to be scrap at best. In fact, they put a battery on it just to move it out of the way and it started. Tried pumping the clutch and it went into gear and it drove out of that field after three decades just sitting under a tarpaulin basically. And so it's been preserved in the condition it was found in more or less with only mechanical repairs to keep it safe and on the road but this is as it has survived it's absolutely incredible a, a time warp is the wrong word because normally that means it's an absolutely impeccable mint example this is not that but it is a great little driver a really nice engine although that is because the engine shortly after arriving with my friend decided to explode so I had to build a new engine for it so that is the story of this super Now it's interesting, it's quite striking how heavy and light the various controls are. The pedals have a lot of resistance for such small, tiny little pedals down there. Not like really, really heavy, but just resisting you. The steering though, with no weight at the front of the car, obviously not power assisted though, is just fingertip light and the steering is just razor sharp. Everything you want sharp, fun steering to be. chuck it into a corner, boot it and go. It does have semi-trailing arm rear suspension because oversteer in rear engine cars can be a serious problem. And they've counteracted that 
bit too much choke. That one can't. But they've counteracted that with pretty clever rear suspension. Oh, this is so much fun. The gear shift though is really interesting. It's a very short throw from the front of the back to the planes, but a really long gap between the first and second plane and the third, fourth plane. Like a really wide throw, you think you're going too far or you've broken something. Just the way it is though. Now this thing was famously built at the Linwood plant in Scotland. Famous because, well, Linwood doesn't really have a history of car building. What they do have is a history of shipbuilding. Unfortunately, the Clyde was, well, hemorrhaging jobs at that point in the 60s. Shipbuilding was in massive decline going overseas. The great liners like the Queen Mary and so forth were no longer being built in that part of the world. And the government needed to find jobs. So the government regional assistance program meant that uh, Roots were paid an awful lot of money to build their new factory in a place where no one had built cars before. This is a great idea in many respects. They needed a factory, they needed investment. They needed to invest heavily in their brand new computerized casting equipment for their all aluminium engine. Unfortunately, that kind of technology is new, exciting, difficult, and takes a bit of a gentle touch. And so there were issues with the build quality for quite a long time. It was also a bit of an issue in terms of logistics because the Linwood factory was 300 miles from Wrighton, which is where the rest of the Roots group was. And the newly cast aluminium engines would be shipped 300 miles down south, where the engines would be machined, and then shipped back north again 300 miles. To help offset these costs, there was a new pressed steel factory up there, and they were producing parts for the Avenger as well, which came down on the same special trains in order to keep the costs at least marginally manageable. So it didn't win car of the year and it didn't get great reputation for reliability. So that did harm sales, but at one point it was the cheapest car on the market in the UK. And they actually built half a million of these things. Although about half of those were actually assembled in the first three years. The Mark II coming out in 1965 and running to 1968. Now I'm doing 50 miles an hour down this road. And although there's a transit up my chuff, it does feel incredibly stable and the engine isn't really laboring or struggling at all and i'm not having to shout to be heard over the wind noise or the engine noise either it really is a very good car this is actually my first ever drive in the driving seat of an imp i've been a passenger in many of them never driven one never really got to appreciate how good these are ask any imp owner which is the better car out of an imp and a mini and they will guarantee tell you the imp is the better car for example when Izzy Gonis was designing the Mini, he told BMC that synchro mesh on all forward gears was not possible. It was an impossibility. Guess what this has got? Yep, on all four of them. So this is just so light, just feather-like handling, so predictable feeling. I absolutely love it. There is something a bit weird doing very tight turns in this, the way the front wheels seem to kind of jump and scrub, which is the same as my 2017 Mercedes does the same thing as well. So it gets at such a hard camber of turn that the wheels just jump across and stutter. Interesting. And the Linwood factory was actually opened by the Duke of Edinburgh, who later on drove one of the first cars out the gates to Edinburgh Airport. And there is something amazing about driving a 1960s car. It's just such a a fresh, uninterrupted feeling. It's just, ah, oh, just leaving the 30 mile an hour roads of the, the housing estate where this car lives. It was just so, so nice. Just such a fresher feeling than a modern car. 60s cars are just so good. So I, I know I was saying 90s cars are peak car, but the previous peak I think probably was the 60s. Just really interesting, clever design. This was so advanced in such a small car. It was a a real breath of fresh air. It was a brave move from Roots to put such investment and such technology into such a small thing. This is a car you feel you can just drive all day and enjoy every minute of it. So much space, lots of room for activities. The little wing mirrors, which literally are wing mirrors, give an almost okay view down the length of the car. I've never got on with wing mirrors, I'll be honest. 
The engine is nice and quiet in the back, doing 60 miles an hour. But the design brief was apparently 60 miles an hour and 60 mpg. Well, they definitely got the 60 mile an hour bit right. I'm not sure it gets quite that good on the fuel. An interesting little thing it does share with the Mini are the exposed hinges on the back and the front. I love that weird thrum it gets as you start pushing up into the high revs. It's really cool. Braking for the 30 mile an hour limit. I haven't actually reached 30 yet. That's another good thing with uh, 60s cars. You feel like you're going an awful lot quicker than you actually are a lot of the time. Considering this is an economy car, it really is astonishingly refined. Lovely ride as well. Not too bouncy, not too soft. And it's got a nice little sweet spot there. And with quite a wide body for the length of the car, it's really well planted. So thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this brilliant little rear-engined 1960s Super Mini. I certainly have myself my first drive of an Imp, I have to be honest, and it has not been disappointing. I've loved it. I hope you have too. If you have, please hit like and subscribe. Join me again next time driving something completely different.